Brady. I'm the director of programs at Ablated Graph. Um, I want to start by thanking our generous hosts, Shelley and Don Rubin, for providing tonight's venue, um, and the staff here at the Eighth Floor. The Eighth Floor is a private exhibition and event space created by Shelley and Don Rubin to promote cultural and philanthropic initiatives. The exhibition you see around you is called um, Draftomania. Uh, it's about the uh, Grupo Antigiano, which is uh, a relatively little-known um, Afro-Cuban art movement. Um, it explores the impact of um, the, this uh, important movement, but relatively unknown outside Cuba, curated by Alejandro de la Fuente. Uh, Ablated Brass is a funding nonprofit that's solely dedicated to nurturing socially engaged art. We do this by funding individual artists and arts organizations who are working directly with communities in ways that are relevant to everyday life at ambitious scale to enact social change. And we also create programs and web content that explores the challenges and opportunities of socially engaged art practice. I have a few announcements tonight. Uh, we're thrilled to announce our new fellows and grantees. The fellows this year, our first cohort of fellows, are um, Brett Cook, Pablo Alguera, Fran Illich, Noreen Letty and Liz Slagas, a duo, Jan Mon, Laura Jo Reynolds, and Jody Wood. Uh, the organizations are Arts East New York, The Foundry Theater, and Not an Alternative. You can sign up for our email list on the table at the front, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with everything our fellows and our grantees are doing. It's going to be a very exciting year. Uh, check out also our growing dialogue, No Longer Interested, in the Discuss section of our website. This is an online forum for debate that features daily responses by Steve Lambert, Jim Wignett, Jonathan Habib Enkvist, and Lars Eric Kierstrom. I'm going to screw up this name. Um, La Paladin, uh, Harold, uh, Harold Fletcher and Mary Mattingly, who's here in the audience somewhere tonight, um, throughout the month of April. And so the, le the latest postings are still going up. Also in Discuss, there's a brand new Fertile Ground essay by Greg Cholette called The Knot. Uh, it's online as of this afternoon, tackling the very same question we're thinking about tonight. Is socially engaged art always progressive? Uh, we are also supporting the Open Engagement Conference, which is May 16th to 18th. It's co-presented by the Queen's Museum and a blade of grass. Um, the free registration is now open, but slots are going very quickly. So if you're interested, hop online just as soon as you get out tonight. Um, and then we have an upcoming program on May 21st at 6 p.m. right here at the eighth floor, Parallel Foods, or Parallel Fields, excuse me, which is about uh, the intersection of food and labor. So it's about sort of the back of house restaurant workers and, and how they um, interface with the outside world. Um, tonight's discussion is aesthetics of doing. Is socially engaged art always progressive? And it will explore whether socially engaged art is necessarily tied to progressive politics. At this moment, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Deborah Fisher, who is also the executive director of a Blade of Grass. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. And uh, thank you, experts. OK. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're, we are going to be asking a, a, fairly, uh, a fairly intense question, actually, whether or not socially engaged art is necessarily tied to progressive politics. We've, uh, we've gathered a fantastic panel, artist Maureen Connor. Uh, Maureen's work combines elements of installation, video, interior design, ethnography, human resources, feminism, and social justice. She's exhibited and taught at numerous institutions and has been a professor at Queens College since 1990. Uh, Maureen is additionally one of the lead faculty of Social Practice Queens, uh, SPQ. It's a unique collaborative MFA concentration that's hosted by Queens College and the Queens Museum. Uh, we also have Joshua Dector, a New York-based art critic, curator, theorist, educator, and editor. From 2007 to 2011, Josh Dector was the uh, director of the Master of Public Art Studies program at the University of Southern California's Roski School of Fine Arts in Los Angeles. And uh, there he founded a new graduate program, an MA in Art and Curatorial Practices in the Public Sphere. His most recent book, do you have a book here? Yeah. <laughs> Just because you 
who've been posting pictures of them on Facebook everywhere you find them. Okay, it's called, um, <laughs> it's called Art is a Problem. <laughs> and it was published by JRP and, uh, what is this? Rainier. Rainier in March 2014. And visiting us all the way from Canada, all the way from, coming from Montreal, we have Mark James Legere, a uh, Montreal-based artist, writer, and educator, who has published numerous essays on art and cultural politics. His most recent book, Neoliberal Undead, Essays on Contemporary Art and Politics, was published by Zero Books in spring 2013. Excellent. I'm really glad that all of you guys are here. Thank you for coming. Uh, tonight, we, uh, we've talked before, actually. Uh, and what we decided was that it would be a really good idea to start narrow, you know, uh, with very specific examples, and then um, and then build out from there, right? So everybody, so each of the panelists is going to do a, five, a quick five-minute presentation of a specific example of, of the progressiveness question, and then we're going to have a, a dialogue, and we'll have some time for question and answer. Maureen, would you like to go first? Okay. Um, you're, uh, Year. I'm just I'm, I'm just going to say a few words. Yeah, before absolutely. Before I show my clip, um, and being the one who's going first, I'm going to take the prerogative of maybe carrying a tiny bit from, from the format. Although hopefully I won't go over my time limit. Um, <laughs> so okay, since I received the invitation to participate in this discussion, I've had many conversations about it, probably as Josh and Mark have as well. Of course, ever. Um, so these have ranged from, okay, first, say no. In other words, what is the question? The question is, is socially engaged art always progressive? No. Uh, it is decidedly not always progressive. Um, for example, I would say the third reich, including Albert Speer, Lady Rippenstahl, Buchenwald. Somebody suggested maybe I should show some clips of Buchenwald as my example. Um, that person will be nameless. Um, the Futurists and others, including as we discussed when we had our conference call, contemporary right wing practitioners like Right to Life. Okay, so that's answer number A. Uh, second answer. Okay, socially engaged art, always progressive. Unpack the question. Open it up to see what universal assumptions it contains. Uh, what is meant by progressive here? Is it simply a menu of liberal values, as might be explained by the American Values Project, which lists the four pillars of progressive thinking as freedom, opportunity, responsibility, and cooperation? Uh, or is it more like Michael Schwab's list found on the commondreams.org website, which is uh, highly recommended by Bill Moyers, by the way. And he says, you might be progressive if you think that it's wrong to allow individuals to accumulate wealth without limits, that ideally no one would have more wealth than they need until everyone has what they need, that the privileges you enjoy because of race, class, gender, and sexual orientation, and physical ability might come at the expense of others. That having women and people of color proportionately represented among the class of oppressors is not the goal. That electoral democracy is not enough. Democracy must also be participatory and extend to the workplace. That regulating big corporations isn't enough. That such corporations, if allowed to exist, must serve the common good or be put into public receivership. That a class system which forces some people to do dirty, dangerous, boring work all the time, while others get to do clean, safe, interesting work all the time, can never deliver social justice. That US military spending is an obscene waste of resources because it only protects the freedom of economic elites to exploit others. That political leaders who engage in preemptive war and invasions should be brought to trial for crimes against humanity, et cetera. There's a lot more to that list. Those are my favorites. Uh, or C, reframe the question. OK, so reframing the question, my version of reframing the question is, what's not progressive about social practice? First of all, I would say, 
um, most frequently, social practice artists are not always honest about answering the question, who benefits most from their project? Uh, and just a, another answer would be, or another sort of, uh, yeah, corollary what's not progressive. For the most part, socially engaged art doesn't begin to try to figure out how to abolish oppressive systems, but only offers momentary and usually kind of feel good help. Now this is all, it sounds like I'm kind of against social practice, which I'm not, um, <laughs> and I'm just unpacking the question. Okay, so now I'm ready for money. Um, this is. I have Norris, 24. She seems to be. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I should. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the trailer for a film that was made in 1983, <coughs> Born, in, Born in Flames, uh, directed by Liz Morton. Adelaide Norris, 24. She seems to be the founder of the Women's Army. Homosexual? Yes. Hillary Hurst, 26. Now we figure her to be the acting leader of the Women's Army. Any general questions you have? Um, why is it called Women's Army? Um, I thought Army is for the men. That sounds awfully masculine. Wake up! White women, get ready. Red women, stay ready, for this is our time. They did blow up the World Trade Center. Actually, it was just the radio tower. Uh, in the film. So the, the plot of the film, uh, well, the film itself takes place 10 years after a cultural revolution uh, that produced a socialist state in New York City. Well, it takes place in New York City, but it produced a socialist state throughout the U.S. Um, and the plot is based around two <coughs> feminist groups, uh, each voicing their concerns uh, to the public by, uh, on, pro on pirate radio. So one group is led by an outspoken white lesbian named Isabel, uh, who operates Radio Regatza. And the other is also spoken African American, whose name is Honey. Uh, and she comes out of Phoenix Radio. The community, uh, which is sort of somewhat dispersed, jumps into action after a world traveling political activist named Adelaide Norris is arrested, arriving at a New York City airport, and suspiciously, suspiciously dies in police custody. There's also, at the same time, a women's army, uh, and that army is advised by Zella, who is actually played by Flo Kennedy, there's various other recognizable people. Uh, in the cast, but recognizable art but I'm not going to take too much time. Um, so the, the Women's Army, along with the activist uh, Adelaide Norris, is under investigation by an FBI agent. Um, so the story it involves uh, several different perspectives from different women, um, different uh, kind of groups and different social positions, but they're all figuring out how to deal with sexism through direct action. And the most famous scene uh, is, is here, part of the most famous scene, which is this band of women on bikes who come to rescue women who are being raped or in some other way uh, sexually assaulted or assaulted. Um, so 
the movie shows women organizing, working in a lot of different situations. Um, and they finally start to come together to make a bigger impact, which, as Wikipedia says, some would call terrorism. Um, ultimately, uh, they're, <coughs> they, they, they're, they're uh, two radio stations are burned down, so they commandeer two trucks, two U-Haul trucks, from which they're broadcasting their pi pirate uh, broadcast, and um, and at the same time they they uh, blow up the tower on the World Trade Center. Simultaneously, uh, or just before they blow up the tower, uh, the president of the U.S. is announcing that he's going to give wages for housework. So they're revolting against that. They say, we don't want wages for housework. Hey, that's too little, too late. So they want to blow up the, uh, the radio tower so that the world, and especially women, will not have to be subject to those kinds of broadcasts anymore. So just to do one thing, uh, both by Liz and Borden, um, and she said that at the time that the film was made, the film occurs in the future after a social democratic cultural revolution. It was always to be borderline between what is present and therefore documentary and what would be fiction, therefore science fiction. I didn't want to make a conventional science fiction film because I wanted it to refer to the present. The reason for setting it after a social democratic revolution is that so many th people think the left will solve the problems of women and minorities, quotes, minorities, quotes. This certainly hasn't happened in modern socialist democracies like France under Mitterrand or even more classical left-wing governments. So the science fiction in the film is to posit this thought. What if the very ordinary oppression that women have been experiencing for generations finally becomes, became something that would force a group of women to become armed and take over the media in order to redirect meaning, reclaim the language? This is science fiction because I don't believe it will happen. So the reason I chose this as my example uh, is because, anybody heard of Lizzie Gordon? Yes, people who know the film, but what is she doing now? Anybody know? Any idea? Me neither. Um, she made another film uh, in 86 called Working Girls. Uh, and so this kind of work, which I consider a form of radical social practice doesn't get supported, hasn't been supported. Thank you. Great, thanks. for me and come back to perhaps um, regrettably since it's rather I think um, a dismal um, diagnosis of the United States and uh, other contexts in the mid 60s but he, he wrote 
I have tried to show how the changes in advanced democratic societies, which have undermined the basis of economic and political liberalism, have also altered the liberal function of tolerance. The tolerance, which was the great achievement of the liberal era, is still professed and, with strong qualifications, practiced, while the economic and political process is subjected to an ubiqu ubiquitous and effective administration in accordance with the predominant interests. The result is an objective contradiction between the economic and political structure on the one side and the theory and practice of toleration on the other. The altered social structure tends to weaken the effectiveness of tolerance toward dissenting and oppositional movements and to strengthen conservative and reactionary forces. Equality of tolerance becomes abstract, spurious. With the actual decline of dissenting forces in the society, the opposition is insulated in small and frequently antagonistic groups who, even where tolerated within the narrow limits set by the hierarchical structure of society, are powerless while they keep within these limits. But the tolerance shown to them is deceptive and promotes coordination. And on the firm foundations of a coordinated society, all but closed against qualitative change, Tolerance itself serves to contain such change rather than to promote it, end quote. So that's Marcuse from 1965, and I think it right. nicely dovetails with aspects of, of what Maureen was discussing. I'm going to shift gears and, and, and give a, a, a quick visual presentation of various uh, art practices, exhibition contexts that in some way suggest the contradictions that I think we are already alluding to. Um, one way to put it in a more kind of even banal way is that, that one can be culturally progressive, and I even heard this from my parents in the 60s, one can be culturally progressive and economically or fiscally conservative, right? And this is pretty banal, but on some level it sticks, right? Now, obviously, we want to think beyond the kind of dialectics of that, but nevertheless, this may go some distance and still identify some of the problems that we encounter. Um, Progressive art, ensuring progressiveness in the arts for generations. That's his first image. A docent performs a progressive critique of the museum. The progressive programming of the museum masks conservative fiscal politics and managerial structures. I've known Andrea for my, almost my entire life, so I, I say that with all due respect. The artist is, can you see the, the, the captions? Okay, sorry. The artist as educator becomes an instigator, an investigator rather, of urban eco-crisis in collaboration with students. Progressive education in action. Progressive art as education blackboard. Thinking about the relationship of notions of the progressive with progressive education, right, within public schools and in private schools here and elsewhere. That's Mark Dion's Project for Culture in Action in 1993. I have to go quickly because our time is limited. Either a collaborative, participatory, collectivist, or a progressive candy bar. This is a project by Renan Sperandio, also from Culture in Action in 1993 in Chicago. This is a Inigo Mangano Valley's Televin Scenario, a street level video project. A project that led to something sustained and sustainable in Chicago street level youth media, a community arts organization for Chicago youth. Um, sorry. These are the various sites of Inigo's project in Chicago, and this evolved into a community arts. Um, a center that still serves at-risk youth in that neighborhood in Chicago that unfortunately it is still relatively marginalized at least economically in other ways within within that city but it is a, it is evidence of, a, of, of sustainability and one might say a kind of sustained progressive mark that's been left in the city uh, unlike some other kinds of projects that did not have such sustained impact within the culture and action Real progress, so to speak, sustained on the ground in Houston for 20 years, not only progressive. Project Row Houses by Rick Lowe, which, again, I mean, one of the things that I've thought about for quite a few years is the question of sustainability. 
less so than the issue of progressive or progressiveness, right? And, and, and the distinction that we understand between, you know, there may be the same artists that do a project, they, they parachute into a project for a few months within a biennial context or another context, and it may work in a particular, operate in a particular way within social networks, and then it disappears <coughs> with trace, perhaps a kind of virtual trace, and between what Rick Lowe has been doing and some other artists, which is to actually build something that continues, it evolves, it mutates, and continues to serve its community and perhaps wider communities. It's hard to be so didactic with these images, we're probably familiar with all these projects, but um, Commission intervention, intervention leading to questionable progress at the San Tijuana San Diego border. Mark Bradford was invited by the organizers of the last version of Insight uh, 2005 San Diego Tijuana to do a project, and he ended up working, collaborating with, so to speak, the Malateros, which are the porters who uh, operate within what we might consider a gray economy within the San Diego Tijuana border. Um, and that was his, he injected these um, essentially store-bought um, uh, elements in, in, into the already existing kind of gray economy within the context. I think not a terribly effective project. Again, the question of whether it's progressive, I, I, I frankly don't think that I can evaluate that because I'm not sure what we mean by this at this point. Um, a local collective already engaged in culturally and educationally progressive activities is refrained within the aforementioned commission context. Bulbo is a, a Tijuana-based and LA-based collective that have been working with youth for many years. That they were brought into the inside context. They were commissioned to do a new project called La Tienda de Ropa. Sorry. Uh, in which they collaborate with citizens of, 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 of uh, Tijuana to develop a new clothesline, but a clothesline that was emblematic of their particular experiences within different parts of Tijuana based upon class and other issues. Very complex and interesting project, and presented in, in a variety of settings, and um, for example, malls within San Diego as well as Tijuana. An ostensibly progressive exhibition project fraught with huge contradictions, that is Prospect One, 2008 in New Orleans, which you probably read about and not visited. Although this particular project did help to facilitate change on the ground and might or might not be a model for other kinds of, uh, other kinds of projects. This is Wangechi Mutu's, Miss Sarah's house, in which there was a fundraiser for a woman who had lost her house uh, uh, due to Katrina. Um, this is the, the sculptural piece, if you will, or the installation, and then the resulting, uh, with the funds that were built, uh, that were generated from an auction uh, benefit, um, Miss Sarah's house was rebuilt on that same site. So a kind of repurposing of that capital. Uh, I think a less successful project, um, or as I've said, a methinks an unsustainable kind of progressive intervention. Uh, within the context of New Orleans, uh, the emergency response studio by Paul Belinsky, certainly well intentioned. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Here we go. Well intentioned, certainly, and, and, and located within the context of other uh, 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 projects that were brought in, for example, very close to where Brad Pitt began his project with his architectural collaborators, so to speak. Um, again, that's a whole other uh, discussion, but that's an actual remains of uh, residence in New Orleans at that moment. The Superflex project when the levees broke, we brought back, we bought our house. Um, a very, as I describe it, a, a convoluted, hyper-conceptualized form of repurposing art to, to help rebuild homes in New Orleans. Progressiveness in a state of suspended animation, I would suggest. Sorry, it's not. It would take a while to sort of discuss this particular thing, but it's quite, quite odd. 
visitors to Prospect One from the art world, or at least part of the art world. All right. And Brad, uh, Mark Bradford, who was also an inside his Mithra project, <coughs> um, as I describe it, the art that probably arrived too late in New Orleans. <laughs> and uh, the ghost of a home, a specter of unprogressive urban politics. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say first, thanks for inviting me and for organizing this event. And I want to wish everyone here a happy first day. Um, I wanted to, uh, with my presentation, not so much um, talk about many examples of uh, socially engaged art, because uh, you know, with the uh, catalogs like Nato Thompson's uh, Living Is Born, or uh, Sculpture Chicago, or uh, the interventionists, we have a lot of examples that we could discuss. Um, so what I wanted to do was to cast, if possible, a somewhat wider net and see how uh, socially engaged art relates to this uh, broader perspective. Um, so I brought two slides uh, that kind of look like a blackboard, uh, but actually I think my aesthetic is uh, French publishing from the 1950s. <laughs> um, so I have two slides, and I may switch back and forth. Um, this one here is something that I uh, came up with for Brave New Avant-Garde, uh, which is a title that I used explicitly because it has a reference to Huxley's Brave New World. So in Brave New World, you know, there are people who are resisting the system, uh, who don't fit into this perfectly organized society, and so there are specific special places we have for them, islands where we send them. So it's all sort of somehow biopolitically uh, orchestrated, and so this is, the framework within which I was thinking about socially engaged art. So in as much as I think that socially engaged art is a, an important transformation in the art field, uh, particularly uh, around the late 90s, early 2000s, um, there is nevertheless this bigger question of uh, biopolitical capture, and so how socially engaged art fits in that context. And I thought one thing that needed to be asked was the question of class, since I'm a Marxist, I'm supposed to ask the question of class. Uh, and it's one thing that gets often left out of progressive academia. So for example, if we're working with <coughs> French theory, uh, postmodern theory, post-structural theory, there's usually at some point a kind of uh, dismissal of Marxism and leftist radicalism as for various reasons, either a um, metapolitics that, you know, as Leotard said, is kind of uh, no longer uh, active or as masculinism, which is a, an interesting uh, crit critique of uh, Marxism. Uh, so I wanted to repose the question of class and think about it in terms of uh, cultural production today. So I took this grid uh, that you find in Peter Berger's book, Theory of the Avant-Garde, uh, in which he outlines a kind of historical development um, of art in terms of mode of production, mode of consumption, and uh, brings it up to the uh, period of the international uh, bourgeois idea of art. And so this allows him to develop the idea of autonomy, historicize the idea of autonomy, historicize as well the critique of the institution art, so the critique of autonomy on the part of various avant-gardes. Uh, Bohemian avant-gardes of the 19th century, historical avant-gardes of the early half of the 20th century, and neo avant gardes of the post-war period. Uh, so these are terms we're fairly familiar with, and I thought something needed to be changed to bring it up to date. Uh, so I added the uh, fourth column that you see here, and I got the idea from Bill Redding's um, The University in Ruins, in which he criticizes um, cultural studies as a model that replaces, to some extent, the bourgeois national culture idea. Uh, but uh, Reddings is also very critical of cultural studies because he sees that as somehow working in tandem with neoliberalization. Um, and he works with Agyem Ben's idea that we're basically in an era of an international, global, petty bourgeois hegemony. Uh, so even though we have bourgeois 
rule in terms of capitalism. We have, let's say, in, in broader social cultural terms, a hegemony of petty bourgeois uh, ideology. And so uh, my ideas for how would you, how one could define those come from Wurzier's book uh, from the 1970s, a distinction. I don't know if you're familiar with distinction, but he sort of at one point uh, makes an interesting uh, um, categorization of bourgeois uh, attitudes towards culture, petty bourgeois attitudes towards culture, and working class attitudes towards culture. And what's interesting is that in his day, in the 70s, uh, the bourgeois attitude in France was very much dominant. So the detached, aestheticized gaze was more or less still the formalist uh, mandate of uh, law of thinking at the time. Uh, so what's interesting is that his ideas are still relevant, only the things have changed to the extent that the petty bourgeois mode of appropriation has become more hegemonic, you could say. Um, and I was excited to discover in my research that Tony Bennett had actually done some statistical research. So what for me was a theoretical hunch, uh, Tony Bennett has actually proved with statistics based on some French research that the attitudes of the very wealthy have more or less come into uh, coordination with popular culture, and that also working class people today are, are much more likely to be educated and to be very familiar with formal culture. So you have a kind of class polarization in terms of uh, economics, but you also have culturally a kind of recentering of uh, dispositions. Um, and so I'm relating this also to uh, uh, work in sociology and political economy uh, that looks at the shift from Fordism to post-Fordism. So with global petty bourgeois, we're in a biopolitical post-Fordist situation. And so the question of labor in relation to cultural production is very interesting. And also, uh, in relation to that biopolitical control, uh, activism becomes one of the modes of production in this uh, petty bourgeois content. So there's a sort of uh, interconnection between activism and socially engaged art that's very activist and biopolitical control. Um, now, if we want to take simply uh, the from a contemporary point of view, uh, think about um, where socially engaged art might fit in these three categories. Um, I have anti-art on the left, anti-anti-art in the middle, <laughs> and anti-art art on the right. <laughs> and the question, uh, is socially engaged art always progressive, is to me is a very interesting question, specifically in relation to uh, Claire Bishop's writing. Uh, Claire Bishop is a well-known British um, art critic who has gotten herself into hot water for asking the question about socially engaged art, well, what are the aesthetic criteria? How can we judge aesthetically uh, the validity of one project against another? And it's a maybe important question in the sense that institutions might have to worry about who they give grants to or not, or who museums should show or not. So these are not completely irrelevant questions, but they sort of, they sort of miss the point of what socially engaged art is doing and especially also in terms of the transformations to the field of art and to the understanding of the theory of art as social practice, as practice involved in social conflicts. So to return to a kind of aesthetic judgment is somewhat uh, apropos or opposite. Um, and so the question is socially engaged art always progressive it sort of flips the question to the question of politics. So rather than judging in terms of aesthetics, we would judge rather in terms of politics. Um, and so with this uh, model, what, what we have here is three possibilities, it, which excludes the possibility of art. You notice I haven't put art on the board. And so I'm completely uninterested in art. I'm completely <laughs> uninterested in idealist bourgeois aesthetics, which are passeist. Uh, even though they may be interesting for us as stages moving towards more complicated uh, developments. And so I sort of take issue with a critic like Grant Kester, for example, who wants to defend socially engaged art by bringing back these kind of um, you know, atavistic models by, from Kant and Schiller without further ado and dismissing everything that's quote unquote avant-garde afterwards. It's a tough pill to swallow. Um, and so art is not on the board. Uh, Anti-art anti art would be you know, what, we, what we know mostly from institutions, university departments and museums. Um, 
where we're very much involved and engaged in critique, right? Basically, everything that is critical today is somehow uh, aware of the heteronomy of art. So the fact that art has to deal with social issues, with social questions. It's not a very uh, difficult point to make. Uh, but it nevertheless at some times tends to reaffirm the art status of what is being made or the art status of the maker. Uh, and so in this category, I, I would refer to it as uh, anti-art art, which is concerned to preserve the, the classification of art. Uh, critic Jean Ray refers to this as um, critically affirmative art, working with uh, Mark Hughes's uh, concept. Uh, in, on the left, is a more countercultural, uh, transgressive model. Perhaps Lizzie Borden's work would, uh, would fit in this category. Um, perhaps uh, counter, uh, subcultures, the discourse around subcultures would fit in this category. Um, it's basically an anti-art that doesn't care very much about the art status. It cares more about the social status and the political effectivity of the work. So what you have on the one hand is escaping art into politics on the left and escaping politics into art on the right. And so ostensibly in the middle, you would have some sort of balance between the two. You would have a metastasis of art and politics. You would have art that is aware of its, its historicity, its development, its critical function, the contradictions of culture, moving towards a revolutionary political transformation. So for me, progressive means militant, radical, avant-garde. And this is the, uh, the middle category. Um, so this is what I'll be working off of in terms of socially engaged art. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, so questions then. Um, you know, based on. Uh, Based on these presentations, the first thing that I'm kind of fascinated by is the way that uh, Josh and Lynn, both of you really uh, were, were questioning the notion of sustainability in very different ways. Uh, but, but you were both really kind of thinking about uh, uh, the sustainability of, of practice. Can, can you go into that notion of sustainability and its relationship to progressiveness? Uh. I mean, I brought that up. Okay, you start. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I brought that up. I, I was, um, I did a essay for After All about four years ago that they, they asked me to write about um, the New Orleans situation in relation to questions of sustainability. Uh, and um, so I, I kind of attacked that issue in relation to the Prospect Show and also another project that was then done. Um, uh, in collaboration with the artist Sam Durant and Rick Lowe. Yeah. They set up a, a, an organization there um, to help support local uh, uh, um, um, cultural producers and, uh, and other kinds of producers. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's, there's, there's a direct interconnection or linkage between notions. I mean, sustainability to me um, would suggest sustained commitment to certain, perhaps, so-called progressive agendas sure. and the implementation of that over a longer period of time. Yeah. So that, for some, might be effective and actually a demonstration of uh, a sustained politic or sort of ideological ethos. Sure. Um, well, Marie, but when you were typing, I don't think sustainability yeah. is progressive per se. I'll just say that. I mean, it's... No. It, it, but, but I do think that it's interesting. I, I do think that there's an interesting relationship because uh, that more you were really pointing out very clearly by saying that uh, you know, Lizzie Borden wasn't making work that was um, sustainable for her, right? And 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 I think that that's actually that's that's a that's an interesting place to start, you know, because I think that uh, you know, Mark, this is this is something that I think you were trying to get at when when you were saying that. Uh, you know, in order for work to be progressive, it has to be it has to be radical. And this is something that Maureen, you and I have talked about before. You know, because a lot of artists who are working with social practice are are collaborating, you know, with institutional authority rather than necessarily uh, opposing it, right? So, so I mean, and and I think that you know, I, Rick Lowe's project is a really great example of this. Actually, the Project Row Houses it makes its own institution 
instead of opposing an institutional authority, right? You know, so, and, and those things feel bundled together, right? I mean, how do you survive as, as an oppositional figure, right? One, and then two, then, you know, how do you, how do you retain, you know, a sense of, of how do you retain a, a, like, a lifelong, you know, cultural and political output, you know, that's meaningful? Well, so, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I have a teaching job. Sure. You know, so yeah. I don't, I feel like I, I, I'm not qualified to answer that question. I, I don't have the right to answer Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, because I, I, I feel like, you know, the same old story of people coming to New York now and how easy it was when I came in the 70s because this was so cheap to live and you know that old story. Um, and now it's, it's so uh, impossible. Mm -hmm. And you know that, that people are forced to <clears throat> to be much more kind of uh, you know participate in the institutions and you know that there's there aren't enough alternatives. Uh, <clears throat> there was a uh, an op-ed, was it an op-ed on Sunday? Or on Sunday about, uh, somewhere in the Times, about uh, collect, uh, worker-owned businesses. And yes, and yes it was a, a writer who was living in a commune or a collective house that um, oh, that yeah. functioned as a bed and breakfast. And um, and the people who, who were part of the collective had to put in a certain number of hours a week to sustain the the um, bed and breakfast, and consequently they had, you know, it's like 10 hours, and then they had the rest of the time, their time with themselves to do whatever. And so it's just a question of buying the time to, to do what you want. I mean, I guess for me at this point in my life, I, I feel like I, I'm not so concerned about artists, you know? I want to make change, mm. you know? And, I, and I'm in a position where I don't have to worry about, you know, of making a living the way a lot of other people do. So that's why I say I'm, I'm not really in a position to, you know, um, I mean, what I would like to, I would like to make opportunities. I would like to embed artists in different kinds of situations as artists in residence, as, as sort of critiques, as mirrors in residence, however you want to frame it. It has to be the right artist, it has to be somebody who's interested in it. But I mean, as an alternative way of, of artists making a living. But, but, but that would go then to the question of what constitutes progressive education to a certain extent. Yeah. Let's say within the art academy, right? Mm -hmm. Loosely, okay. loosely defined. And, and, and I mean, because I think that everybody here, I assume, is taught in one way or another. I don't know. So there's there's a pedagogical element here, yeah. and, and, and so I think that the question of how one utilizes teaching as an instrument for social change, so to speak, broad, broadly, which is what I think you're alluding to, has to be addressed. And certainly the, I think the, the, the broader issue of um, protests against debt, right? Indebtedness, uh, um, tuition, you know, full Cooper reunion saga, which continues. Um, as, as, as you know, activism both generated by students right within the, the art academy and outside of that, and sort of we haven't talked about the Occupy movements in different ways, but I think that's also sort of part of this this constellation and trying to see. I mean, I think when you there are certain institutions of education that are endeavoring to be in the broader sense more progressive than others, right? And there are others that are playing catch up to this, and one might look at this in a more optimistic way, or one might look at it in a more skeptical way, but those that are trying to play catch up, right? And those who are sort of at the so-called vanguard or neo-vanguard of progressive education. So I think that's a broader issue that, that within the New York and I think other contexts we would have to address. And we can see the sort of ideological tendencies of these different academic constructions. Um, so that's one way to think about the progressive, particularly when we talk about how social practice, so to speak, has migrated into and been taken up by various educational complexes. Right. right. Well, it's interesting to me that, it, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I have a few yeah, points. Yeah, please, like please. Um, thanks for the question, too, because um, we were asked to give examples of 
not progressive art as well for this evening. It was part of the paragraph that you wrote. Uh, so I did come up with uh, uh, something that, it's not art per se, but it's a um, description of Project X uh, from the Art Gallery of Ontario. So it's a job, de it's a job description uh, from 2007. The museum required that its candidate for the position of community arts facilitator have experience in the design and delivery of workshops, projects, special events, and other experiences that encourage people to explore local identities as well as institutional collections. The projects were to evolve with community members working in schools, community centers, public spaces, and community festivals. The prospective employee was to facilitate the creation of legacy projects that reflect issues of concern and that propose mechanisms for sustainable creative engagement at the local level. The facilita facilitator was to develop content and delivery of web-based initiatives mediating the presentation of collections. The facilitator was also expected to demonstrate experience working collaboratively with other artists as well as diverse communities to have a degree in fine art or art history with two years of experience working as an artist facilitator, quote, within a variety of community-based situations, <laughs> to have experience developing curriculum, experience working in museums and or other cultural institutions. She or he was to have technical proficiency in digital photography <laughs> and video production, as well as skills in image manipulation and video editing. And the position was part-time and temporary. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to do an interview with the person who landed the job. And then when, she, when she got a sense of what I was after, she just broke off. <laughs> so it, it, it was compensated or uncompensated? It was not. It's not. It, it was compensated. Part-time temporary, compensated, yeah. compensated work. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, the glass is full and half full and half empty, right? I mean, that's. Are you objecting well, to the language or the, it's also, it's the precarity? It's like a different kind of glass, you know? Industrial labor yeah. is a certain kind of glass, and precarious labor, where you have, where you're expected to have a lot of qualifications, a lot of education, a lot of skills, with very little delivery, yeah. uh, is a different kind of glass, you know? So if we're going to be either pessimistic or optimistic, we have to know what we're swimming in. Are you suggesting that this language is, and it may well be, kind of the creative class language? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is proliferated in New York City, right? And, uh, well, all of the, I mean, go to Detroit, go to Fort Michigan. I mean, are, are you suggesting that, I mean, maybe you're not, and maybe this is something that we can discuss, that the language, that the, the, some of the language that we find within social practice, let's say broadly within either, let's say, Missioning social pra practice, teaching it, um, curating it, or, 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 or artist collectives, what have you, is somehow being hijacked, if you will, or reappropriated by those. I mean, I think I there's think, a lot I of that. Imminent. I think it's imminent to the situation and what, what calls for the need for socially engaged art, for example. So, what I'm saying is, it's a socially engaged art is a, a form of labor that is a greater degree of exploitation because it goes to the core of who we are. It, it, it's about affectivity, it's about sharing, it's about knowing people, it's, it's socializing. The instrumentalizing. It's far, it's far you know. more instrumentalizing and more exploitative than previous forms of art production. It was you know, maybe a lot easier to be in a studio and make paintings, for example, less demanding. Are you suggesting that the, that, 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 I think that participation be. is a mirage somehow, that it's also kind of, that it's, that's, that it's it's bad ideology, the notion that participation somehow masks, in fact, instrumentalization it's to a, a certain extent. Yeah, it's a mirage that's very, that's very real. I, that, that's, I would, I would, I would it's more or less agree with this. It's mediated yeah. technologically, yeah. Uh, and because of the way it works, uh, you know, we're sort of compelled to participate in these kinds of events. Flash mobs are an example of these sorts of things, or uh, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, progressive festivals. And I guess what I'm saying is. Uh, that it sort of, it channels energy, <coughs> it reorganizes energy around certain kinds of, um, certain kinds of affect, certain kinds of uh, work, certain, you know, social work, uh, remedial uh, improvement, uh, these kinds of uh, things that we've associated with bourgeois reform since the early 20th century, which, you know, Andrew Fraser is very uh, aware of in her projects. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't channel energy into political organization. 
So what are the kinds of socially engaged art that very specifically are more tailored towards political organization? Those would be more the more progressive, I would say. What do you mean by political organization? I mean, I mean something like uh, the Situationists organizing students and you know creating a general strike that lasted for one month. Well, we saw we saw this demonstrated in the Cooper Union that, that students occupied the president's office for much longer than a month. And yeah, but they didn't shut New York City down for a month. Well, but that's also well, then one has to go to talk about the Occupy movement movements uh, and think about well, why was Zuccotti targeted at initially and not other sectors of the city, which is what I thought should have happened as a, as a lifelong New Yorker. If you, want to, if you want to attack the power, capital, real estate, you go to where people live, work. That eventually ended up happening, but in a very kind of, I think, as an afterthought, right? So yeah. anyway, that's just another, but yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree that, 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 that strategically and tactically there are problems, but I, I think that when students self-organize, that, that is political, and if they take perhaps leads from artists, uh, educators, and others who are involved with the long evolution of what we call today social practice. It's not a new phenomenon, right? I mean, that's, I mean, one can go back to various sort of historical trajectories and trace this out, but I think that there are synergies there which are, in fact, deeply political and deeply effective to a certain extent, right? Then I would have to default to, I think, the more Marcusean argument, or you could default to the more, maybe, uh, another argument. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually when you brought up Bourdieu because, sorry David, but when I was in the Windy program and I met Andrea Fraser and Amy and others, Bourdieu was, you know, at the center of these discussions and I, and I, and, 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 and Andrea wrote considerably about, Andrea Fraser wrote considerably about Bourdieu and, and sort of talked about it more or less in the same way that you were discussing it and look where we are today. And I'm just saying that, I'm not saying that Andrea is complicit in this, I'm just saying that the reason I showed her practice is that precisely the contradictions that exist today are somewhat analogous to social or social engaged practice have been embodied and embedded there for a long time, right? And we try, you know, so. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to cut you off as much as I want to make sure that, you know, Maureen, I think that, I'm interested in, in I think that you guys are right, you're pointing to a very interesting way that, that social practice has the relative capacity to contain um, you know, the desire for change rather than actually like get to real social change. But but Maureen, you had you had you had this this very beautiful impulse, you know, uh, a, a couple of minutes ago, right? Where you're you're like, I don't even care about art, I just want I want to make change, right? <laughs> so so can we can we get back to that for a second and, and how how does that work on a practical level? You know, how do we get out of the container? Right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, Josh kind of called me up on, well, you're teaching, you know, which is, of course, you know, absolutely right. And so how do I handle it there? And, um, and, and I feel like it's a huge challenge because I teach at a public university. And, um, you know, I was sort of starting with uh, a situation where, well, like the neo avant-garde, you know, I mean, People in undergrads in my class, one of them is in the class here, and I ask people, you know, okay, after doing a reading, um, why should you care about the avant-garde? I see that you don't, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'd like to know, does anybody care? You know, why should you? And, uh, you know, and then of course, well, you could come up with a lot of answers like, well, because the avant-garde never, you know, reached its promise, it had all kinds of, of uh, you know, potential for actually wanting to make change and wanting to change the world, and you know, why should why should we just assume that that those those values and those those uh, kinds of in instincts and forces and desires uh, should just be left behind? You know, um, it's just that we need to give them new form, maybe. You know, but I mean, at least that's that's yeah. that's to me why you need, why you should care and about again, the other and, part. And, but how do you step out of, I mean, as, as an artist, as an educator, is it even desirable or, 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 or useful to even consider stepping out? I mean, where, to step out into what exactly? Well, Some imaginary space? Well, of, that's, that's a question. I mean, I ask myself, you know, every day I say, maybe, I, you know, art is not the place. Maybe I should just do activism, you know? I mean, I ask myself that really every day and several times a day. You know, so, uh, and, and I don't know how to answer it. 
why, why can't they, and then as I think sort of Mark was some of the, um, the charting, so to speak, lays out, I mean, there, there are interpretations <laughs> here, right? And so I, I, I don't, I mean, the art activists. I'm not proposing selling the stores, as you said. I'm not saying <laughs> no. get rid of art. I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm just speaking for myself, you know, um, where I see that there's agency. And I don't know that there's a lot of agency in the world of art. You know, and, and you know, Deborah brought up the question about, about institutions and, you know, I mean, we're in an institution right now. Yes. I, um, yeah, I've laid across as an institution. That's something that we talk about every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have a hammer and sickle, you know, you have a blade of bricks. Right. You know, I have to. I actually have to to uh, credit my friend Michael Kors for that one. That was good. Yeah, thank you, Michael Kors. Uh, so no, seriously. I mean, it, so 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 there is this so there is this question, you know, about whether or not our our an artist can escape institutional frameworks. One of the things that we think about a lot at Avoid Across is, is this idea that, you know, instead of instead of working within institutional critique, artists, you know, the artists that we're working with are actively engaging, they're making their own institutions, right? And and they're actively engaging institutional power in a very direct way. And and um, and we like to think, and, and I want this problematized by this group, we um, we tend to think that that, that agency is um, interesting, real, you know, and that and that it has um, and that it has the capacity to be nurtured in a very specific way, right? So um, and and that that's really different than the kind of artistic freedom, you know, that I went to art school personally to find. That's a different kind of power, right? That doesn't have any agency attached to it whatsoever. Actually, it lacks agency in a lot of ways. Um, so. What you're looking for agency. You well, you wind up looking for agency, but you can do whatever you want, but you can't value your own work. You can't, you know, you can't. You can't. Make it's hard to find an audience. Exactly. Right. So, so I guess, so I guess, so to make this into a question, right? Um, I guess I'm wondering, do you, what about artistic agency? You question it, Mark. What do you think? Um, I, what well, can I, artists do? In terms of institutions, there's a few things. One is um, the fact that in terms of in terms of the anarchist tendencies yeah. of uh, exodus from the institution, right. I think those are those are to be uh, applauded. Uh, but there is a there's a there's a problem in to the extent that it's assumed at times that um, if you're doing activist work, it has a cultural dimension. For, you, know, you just say that, uh, yeah. but that in a way it sort of doesn't have to concern itself with what our institutions are saying. And I kind of don't agree with that. I think that the discourse of art doesn't is not limited to the four walls of a particular space, and that it's uh, ambient. And so, in some ways, they're going to sort of come across the question. They're going to have to deal with some people who are going to be asking questions of, uh, you know, if their concern is simply to have political objectivity, then in a way they don't have to worry about it. But the art question remains, and so they would be what I what I'm saying. Um, is escaping art into politics, and right. what I what I've, uh, the the other point would be that from what which I'm, I'm con from which position on the sort of uh, anarchist wait, tendency, where is that? Where is that anarchist chart? Tendency. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. escaping art into politics, um, and in terms of the institutions that we know, of course, we, we can work with them, but I think what's more important is to occupy them and radicalize them. I think that's what has to happen. Right. So this Cooper Union is a good example. But who does the occupying? Well, and, and, it, I, I, I well, mean, you know, this may, you know, you North that America be, that be engineered from the outside. You know, I'm not sure exactly part, where it's happening, is, but I'm just saying yeah. this is what needs to happen. But well, it's I'm interesting sure. because because it just some, yeah, but yeah. it's interesting because because the, no, the term intervention, or, or, I mean, NATO talks about the interventionists that existed before them, and the Insight Project often you utilize the term intervention beginning, frankly, in the 1990s already, and to a certain extent, Mary Jane Jacob utilized it already, culture and action to a certain extent, and um, of course, intervention is a loaded term, right, and, and there are people, I remember doing a talk in Mexico City, and somebody called me out saying, when you use the term, this was this was post, I mean, this was during Iraq, and, and somebody said, when you use the term intervention, are you, are you somehow, don't you realize that the, the militaristic and governmental implications and dimensions of this? I said, of course, but we had an interesting discussion. So I think that 
Um, so the, the terminology itself has to be addressed. And also I'm thinking about the question of if, if, if we're concerned about the, 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 the recoding of activism on aesthetic terms, or on, uh, 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 that is the recoding of activism or, or, or even sort of anarchistic or occupational um, uh, actions through the language of art. I think that could be a deep, uh, a, a considerable problem. I'm not so concerned about people exiting art for politics. The more the merrier, more power to them. I wish I could do that. Um, but I'm concerned about this kind of hijacking reappropriation of language that, that seems to be taking place. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, and what's ironic is that, that, that the more that contemporary art appears to become, as I think you were alluding to, uh, a more having a more centralized location or locus in the broader culture, there may, this may provide opportunities for kind of Trojan horses, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you I, I, I want to make sure I understand that last point. What kinds of Trojan horses? Well, I, that's 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 not clear at, at this point. But I think there are opportunities. I mean, I think some of the, there are there are artists, some, even somebody like Trevor Paglin, who's already been on sort of he's been on TV. He's talked about his 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 work and his writing. I, that's not a Trojan horse per se, but at least somebody who's able to sort of to move and operate in different realms broader culture, popular culture, if you will, as well as and then more specialized within art discourse. And I think that kind of artist who's able to sort of mobilize, maybe Rick Lowe is another kind of person like that, but that kind of, the artist who is not bound to particular this kind of space, if you will, but can move from space to space, is I think what I'm alluding to. And, um, and that, that requires a certain skill set, requires a certain communication, Sure, absolutely. So um, getting back to, I mean, one of the things that I'm kind of struck by, right, actually in this conversation is that you've got these like, uh, these three, you know, kind of spatial metaphors that are kind of coming, you know, there's this, there's this notion of the of occupy, the occupy, occupation, right, um, you know, or, or infiltration, right, and then there's the intervention, right, or, yeah, uh, uh, and then there's also this, this kind of uh, uh, community playpen, you know, uh, kind of problematic aspect of social practice that you actually perfectly mark, uh, exemplified with that job description. That was really interesting. Um, you know, and I, and I guess I wonder, you know, like how, when artists are traveling through these spaces, and, and I agree with you that, that it's very important for artists to be able to, to work in lots of different uh, arenas in order to maintain a sense of agency. You know, how, how do you know, how do you maintain a sense of, of, of how you're leaving? Sorry about that. Um, how do you make how do you make sure you don't wind up in the in the playpen where you're 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 pretending, you know, at community, you know, and, and producing palliative, feel good, um, unimportant uh, work that contains uh, instead of instead of breaks out. I, I would have an answer to that. Yeah, do it. I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I, can I go back to do my it. slide? Do it. Yeah, you can totally go back to your slide. Um, one of the, um, I mean, what interests me, yeah. and I think you've seen Brave New Avant Garde, there's yeah. a certain amount of psychoanalysis exactly. in Brave New Avant Garde. Um, and I've also written an essay that deals with art criticism about socially engaged art or social practice. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, one of the ways that I define these three categories is um, the left would be the idiot, uh, the right <laughs> would be the moron, and the group in the middle would be the imbeciles. Uh -huh. um, okay. And so the, the morons are the people who think that they can do something that is socially or aesthetically or politically guaranteed that somehow there's something in place in terms of the symbolic order that I can respond to and conform to. Mm -hmm. uh, the idiots on the left, they think that they can completely get away from these uh, injunctions. And so they're, they, they sort of feel or think that they're detached from something. And often when you think that you're at a, at a distance from something, you're actually functioning in terms of its logic. Right. Uh, and the imbecile, uh, would be the person who's aware of these mandates, these injunctions, but doesn't trust them, doesn't believe in them. Uh, so there's a sort of mental, mental psychic operation 
that takes place, that can take place in terms of radical practice. But wait a minute, so the, who, the, 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 <laughs> the, so the anarchists or the idiots? I'm sorry, or the, the morons? Yeah. The, uh, the anarchists or the idiots? But you're Greg Chalet, Greg Chalet is uh, on the left, he's with the idiots. <laughs> and uh, so is Brian Holmes. Okay. <laughs> We're bringing this to my yeah. Claire, Claire Bishop and um, um, Grant Kester are morons. Both <laughs> <laughs> morons. Oh. And I'm an imbecile. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> The only problem with this chart, the only problem with this chart is that you, 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 do, you actually don't get away from art. Art is all over this. Right, but right. Well, what, what I'm that. saying is, that, what yeah, I'm saying I'm not is, suggesting it's, 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 it's for me. Thing is, there's no such thing as art. Art, art is heteronomy. Art is a disciplinary from the get-go. It's a social product. Okay, so in a way, art, art is always theorized. It's, it's realized reflexivity that's always trying to be aware of its conditions of possibility. Then why are you using the term? I'm not using the term, I'm using other terms. No, you know, it's everything, all those categories are art. There's, you're not... What I'm saying is there's no art art. There's no tautology, so I'm not working with a nominalist framework. Uh, yes, you are. Anyway, okay. Okay, no, don't be technical, guys. Wait a minute. Yeah, we're already using the Okay, so, yeah. Did I cut you off just now? You're the only artist here, right? Yeah. I mean, artist. you're an artist, sorry. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So, um, I guess, you know, if I was going to ask, if I was going to ask one more question, I guess I would ask you the question that was was um, most difficult. Like I think during our, our call, just to go all in, right? Um, you know, and. and I think that we had a very interesting conversation about whether or not artists are even qualified, you know, to, you know, or or the or the best judges of, of what of, of 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 how to make really good political change, right? Like, is there what are the limitations of that role? What are the um, does the role of artist does the role of artist make you an expert in social change or political change or you know um, and and how how do artists operate in this framework? Well, I mean, you introduced us as experts. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah keep, keep going. I'm interested. And I was actually, I meant to say, glad I did, that I don't really consider myself an expert. Yet. Uh, but, well, I was, expert yeah. Expert what, though? Well, that's the question. Sure what what, what, You're what an expert of your experience, Maureen. Yeah, and that's and and that's what I meant. But uh, but no, you're absolutely right. So I guess you're my worrying about the big other. Yeah. So I mean, I guess what? <laughs> Me? Sorry, that's an I am. <laughs> I mean, to grab the question, I mean, I think that a lot of a lot of so there's a lot of bad social practice out there, and and, and the bad and, and a lot of bad social practices. A lot of a lot of bad. What do you say, Deborah? What do you? I mean, I don't want I don't want to defend that. So I would let you know. Okay. I, I was actually the, the um, so um, so there's a there's a lot of bad social practice out there that is bad specifically because it it it, it walks into a situation that it doesn't really know anything about the nuances of what's going on, and it and it and it declares or or. Um, a sort of expertise in other people's business that it has no business declaring, right? And we've yeah. seen that project, right? Yeah. Where? Where? Yeah. Can you I mean, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to cite an example for that. No, no, yeah, 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 absolutely. But but Mark, you know, when I, when when Mark Dion, you know, started sort of reinventing his practice in the late '80s, approximately. He always referred to himself as a, as a dilettante, you know, as a kind of amateur researcher. And, and I felt that was, I felt poignant, and I think it still is. And, and, and he identified himself in that way for political reasons yeah. and other reasons. So, so that the notion of expertise was already sort of put out there um, and, and uh, carefully. Yeah, I agree Or not with that. put out there, actually, suspended. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we want to use an example, let's use uh, the Gramsci Monument, shall we? Sure. Okay, yeah. An example of the Gramsci Monument, bad social practice. Um, and this did come up in our conversation. 
I know, which is why this is going to be great. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I was I was actually reading um, Keith Brown, who who said something that I want to I want to second, which is I do not want my students reading about Hirshhorn and thinking that this is a successful model that should be followed. Uh, Keith in Chicago, Keith Brown. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I like him a lot. Yeah, yeah. He's an up and coming. <laughs> he's he's cool. Whatever intellectual artist. Yeah. Well, he likes you. I love him. He's great. <laughs> you should bring him. We should bring Keith Brown to New York and do something. Okay. Well, no, Mark's here now. Let's talk. No, about sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's a terrible no, no, I'm so wait, and Mark, you you wrote wait, wait, wait about that on you as well. Can wait, I? Can yeah. I say a little go, more go, go, about, go. about it? Um, I mean, I I think that uh, he doesn't really try to make a difference. You know, he came in, he, 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 he para he's a perfect example of an artist who parachuted in, mm -hmm. did his thing, and left. You know, and, 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 okay, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, you could, you could interview a million people who were there, and some people are going to say that they got something out of it, and, and some people will say that they didn't, and they, or they'll say that they thought it was condescending. But, you know, again, he also said some interesting things about you know, beyond that, which was, um, what exactly, hold on one second. Uh, um, do you have a link to that article? That you yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. yeah. Okay. If, you send actually, it, if you send it to us, we'll put it on our social media now. It was like, a little bit the tomorrow. online engagement yeah. website, right? No, I it was um, it was just something yeah, that he put thing. on. I saw it on on Square. Yeah, because I yeah. Um, and he was he was quoting uh, a review in Art Forum, which I got. That's yeah. great. Okay. I mean, Glenn Ligon's piece in Art Forum, right? No, it wasn't Glenn, Glenn Ligon. Ligon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was a review and then, well, anyway, uh, by yeah. Jules, somebody. Oh. Um, and anyway, he was saying that uh, there was. Well, Glenn Ligon, he was quoting Glenn Ligon as saying that he saw all kinds of spelling mistakes on the graffiti, spelling and grammar mistakes, and wouldn't it have been useful to actually give a class or some classes in spelling and writing, for example, instead of just offering, uh, you know, lectures on philosophy or, or, or very um, sophisticated poetry readings. Uh, See, but I, did, I have a bigger problem with the politics of that assessment than what actually happened at Gramsci Monument. You know, because that's like really declaring. Well, okay, but, all right. Uh, I, okay, I can, I can understand that. Yeah. But then he goes on to say, how about using that money in another way, which is what I thought of from the beginning. Like, how about uh, getting school teachers to come and work with the students and, and create workshops for the school teachers? You know, give the school teachers it, who teach in the Bronx something that they need and facilitate that rather than just making this a kind of you know idealistic kind of universalist model of you know I don't know what Mark can I take an oblique uh, angle Please. to what uh, we're talking about um, in terms of if we look at this in terms of uh, political economy and ideology and in terms of labor. Um, there's an interesting article by um, David Graeber um, called On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs. <laughs> ah, I've seen this article and I've never read it. It's in uh, Strike Magazine, uh, 2013. And he's just, he's just going over this idea that we've moved from a uh, condition of formal subsumption of labor, which is basically the industrial model in which, how, in which capitalists want to know, how, how can you extract more surplus from the labor of your employees? It used to be you would lengthen the working day. Uh, and then after a while, you can only lengthen, you can only make people work so much. Except in France. Possibly 18 hour, <laughs> 18 hour days for children, for example. Right. Uh, so then you start you know, giving people better conditions of living, and so what you have to do is you have to think of other ways, and one of the ways was mechanization. And so with mechanization, we were able to produce enough commodities to satisfy most people's needs. And so ostensibly, the, the, um, the uh, Keynesian dream would be that we would have enough so that people only had to work two days a week. But we don't have that society. What we have instead are people who are working 
longer hours, more working all the time, where play and labor is <coughs> coterminous. Um, and um, so this is what you know Marxists refer to as the real the, the real subsumption of labor. And as part of all this, what we have is a growth of a services. Of, of caretaking services, you know, massages and spas and all these kinds of things that people basically don't need, but we need those jobs because we need people to find some way to make a living so that they can then continue to buy commodities. And so our economy keeps growing and growing, and so we have a growth of these kinds of caretaking uh, industries, service industries, and so a lot of uh, work like uh, Thomas Hirshhorn's work falls into that. Now, one of the interesting things is that this is not always satisfactory, and so people are overworked and underpaid, and so there would be reason for them to rebel. Yeah. And so what do, you, what do you use to prevent them from rebelling? What, what are the incentives for people to not rebel? One of the things in a risk society is that you have to maximize your self-interest and minimize your, the risks. And minimizing risks means being careful about the way you interact with people being pleasant and being bright-sided, as Barbara Aaron Wright calls it. Sure. And so these kinds of uh, convivial spaces are very much about this kind of management, you know, growth of management industries, growth of the, the psychotherapy, and so on. Uh, and, you know, uh, Kirshner is an interesting person because he hasn't gone through what the new right wanted, which was to get rid of experts. They wanted to get rid of people who were authoritative, not authoritarian, but authoritative about what they were doing and what they do, and to sort of and to sort of de-skill every area of the professions. And so you could more easily manage it. Just look at what's happening with the delivery of education in universities, the pressure on teachers to, and do, and and yeah. to, to deliver outputs and so on, and to sort of keep keep things rolling as a you know as a mechanism where you could you know sell a lot of textbooks or you could uh, grow art, uh, grow departments with and graduate programs. This is the context in which I, I interpret a work like uh, Hirschhorn's, and I appreciate the way he inhabits that uh, that construct, and the fact that he has Gramsci at the center of it is very interesting in terms of the hegemony that we're looking at. But isn't it a, perhaps a misnomer to even apply the term whatever social practice means, which requires constant unpacking, so to speak, yeah. to something like Hirschhorn? I mean, I don't think I could be Correct. I don't think he's referred to this project or anything else he's done as social practice. It's it's, it's being projected on him. So well, I think it's a bit of a like community project. Yeah. But it's it's but it's but he's never used. As far as I've seen, he's never referred. I mean, I think language is important, right? And and, and the terminologies are important, or they can be thrown out. But he's not referred, from what I've read or what I understand, to his work as social practice. He doesn't yeah. align himself yeah. and that's what's with, interesting about with a Rick yeah, Lowe that's or anyone about else. It too, because, so yeah. maybe there's a miss, maybe we're not. Well, on the other hand, I mean, he's not calling the work social practice, and the way that he describes his work is very different than the way that I've experienced it. And I think that that's an interesting aspect of his work. But I need to cut it off because we need to open it up to the floor. Who has questions? Can you put this on? Yeah. Hello? Who's, uh, who, who has questions? We have time for a few questions. In the back. Hi. Um, thank you for your question. Um, actually, I want to ask everybody to do something for a second. Um, I need you to look at who's on the panel. Literally, I need everybody to look at who's on the panel. And I need everybody to look at who's in the room. And I need you to look at the room. Take a minute and just look at the room. Don't look at me. <laughs> and then you all came in through the street. I need you to think about the neighborhood. I don't think that this demonstrates that socially engaged art is any more progressive than any other art that I have been involved with in New York City. I'm very familiar with this block. Uh, I've taken my kids to places that. here, I've eaten in restaurants here, so on and so forth. I'm so I'm not sure what you mean by your, your need we to... We are very far from the street. The community that is here is really similar to other communities that I have engaged with throughout my lifetime in New York. Making art and talking about different kinds of practice. 
And I think first we really need to hold ourselves accountable for making a kind of change into the kinds of things that are happening in this room. And my question is, how do we do that? I'm not sure exactly. Um, suggests that somehow white individuals, I don't even know, I don't even know if I consider myself a white individual, I don't know about the other panelists, can somehow not address issues is tantamount to something that, a word that I don't want to use here in relation to what you just said. No, I think you should. No, I don't want to use it because it's a waste of everyone's time. It's, I, it's, just, it's, 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 it's just not constructive. So this is one place this is one, there are multiple events happening as, a, as somebody who got immersed in social media purely to kind of promote educational stuff years ago. There are multiple events happening tonight, multiple events happening tomorrow, in all parts of New York, all the various boroughs. It's too many things for us to even attend with people of various creeds, colors, ethnicities, class, backgrounds, so on and so forth. I understand what your intervention, so to speak, is here. But um, I think you're basing it upon assumptions that, that perhaps are a bit skin deep. And you need to look beyond skin, don't you? I think we all do. If I were older, whiter, and more male, would you have spoken to me in that way? Absolutely. And, and I've done so. You need, to, you, need to, you need to Google my name and look at what I've done over the past 30 years in the art world. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm combative with everyone. It started with my, my late parents and it's continued. So, you know. What do you think is so great about being here that it is worth what you have made out to be your precious time? What is great about this room? Um, and how do you share that? Well I, I Okay. Yeah, I think maybe another question. We don't have much time. Yeah, we want to make sure that everybody's got a chance to ask questions who wants to ask questions. Anybody else want to ask a question? I was wondering if um, Mark would elaborate more on his imbecile list. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's more. Who's on it? Who would be on it? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. But wait, you're an imbecile, right? I consider myself an imbecile. Yeah, I'd like yeah, to be so an imbecile. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 one of the reasons that I came up with this uh, actually, the, the terms, I should say, uh, imbecile, moron, and idiot come from Zizek's Less Than Nothing. It's the first few pages in Less Than Nothing. Yeah. Um, and it was had to do with my interest in Greg Shalette's idea of dark matter. I was writing an essay on Godard's film Socialist. Uh, and I was thinking of Godard as, you know, some, someone asked me a question like, who do you, who's your favorite filmmaker? Or worse than that, who's the best filmmaker? Uh, how do you answer such a question? You can't answer, you know, anybody who's thought about these things can't answer that kind of question, but if I had to give it an answer, I'd say Godard's probably one of the best filmmakers, radical filmmakers. And, uh, and I'm thinking, so he's, he's if, if the art world is a Ponzi scheme, <laughs> like uh, my friend uh, Bruce Barber says, 
then perhaps Godard, as a highly canonized, recognized figure, uh, would be somewhere close to the summit. And I was, and I was, just in relation to Greg Chalet's idea of dark matter, I'm thinking, well, yeah, okay, dark matter represents the, the you know, the, the majority of people who don't, who are artists who don't make a living from their art. Uh, Godard is not in that group, but uh, I still consider Godard to be dark matter. I still consider Godard to be radical, and even though he's canonized, and so there's something about Godard that not quite canonized. And it's very interesting because if you talk to people in film theory, they often don't like Godard. They'll dismiss him because they know they're supposed to like him. And yet he keeps coming out with amazing films that are challenging, that are aesthetically interesting, and that are politically acute. Um, so that was, you know, that that's kind of, and if I consider the middle category, avant-garde, um, you know, it's not, it's not so important in terms of judgment to say, you know, this is a avant-garde. I would consider Thomas Hirschhorn, forgive me for being one of these artists, <coughs> who balances art and politics very effectively. Um, I, also, I also like uh, Christoph Adichko's work. I think that uh, his project for the Institute for the Abolition of War, where he wants to surround the Arc de Triomphe in Paris with a uh, anti-war structure is brilliant. On the one hand, because it's community art, but, on, but also because he's not working with disadvantaged communities. He's working with the most advantaged people in the world or in France, who you would have to appeal to to get their consent in order to build this uh, temporary or permanent structure, hopefully permanent structure. So uh, I like this kind of being able to sort of balance radical aesthetics, radical autonomy with a political revolutionary uh, thrust in which in which it would be possible for the work to also be useful to activists. Activists could point to that work as an example of something important that people have seen and talked about. Uh, so it, it should be the kind of work that supplements in some ways uh, whatever radical movements we have, whether they be uh, social movements, whether they be NGOs I'm a little bit less optimistic about because I find they're too much part of the developmental language that's very capitalist. Uh, I prefer Trotsky art parties. They're not very powerful right now. Uh, you know, good, luck with that. good luck with that in New York. He's improved by good luck with Trotskyism in New York. They're so isolated. Not the token will get you uptown. They're so isolated. But we need more of these groups. We need more cells. We need more independent cells. We need more parties. Forming. Good luck with using the, the term cell in New York City post 9-11. I mean, listen, there was an article in the Times, uh, Ross DeHoe, I believe, wrote it for this today or yesterday, column about how, you know, Marxism is back with fury, and, you know, oh, yeah. and there we go. Um, fine. Uh, more, more power to, well, I mean, we're all sort of Marxists in one way or another, I suppose, uh, by, by 2014. But I think you have to be more, I mean, at first, I, I think it's, it's very amusing, the terminology. Um, because to me, I think another terminology, that we, another word that might be used is, is hypocrisy. Um, not, not, any, not hypocrisy here, but just the fact that there are individuals who inhabit positions of power who are not, who are not talking about uh, how they utilize power, right? Institutionally and otherwise. And they're being hypocritical about it, and they're being unethical about it, and they need. And these are people who are involved in, yes, progressive practices. And um, so I think hypocrisy is a scourge on the land um, that needs to be addressed. And it, uh, so I think that's another category that should be added to. Um, to I, I would worry a little bit. I think the moral charge might be, you know, you might be conflating a little bit the intentions of the person and the, the work, whether the work has a kind of effectivity that's... No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about not taking responsibility for how the individual constitutes their own power and how the individual individual's power is, is re-empowered within certain institutional sites, that's all. It's making assumptions that the, their institutional positions um, should not be taken into account in, in terms of a discussion about what, what they do. And I think that's, that's a significant problem. I, so, 
Yeah, I, I think, context in it? I, I, can't, I'm not, I can't get into details about this. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's across the board. Anyway, I don't think, you know, you need to be specific about this issue. It's, a, it's um, not a moral issue. It's an ethical question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, a, not moral. Yeah. It's an ethical question. I mean, it's I feel that way. I feel, I'm sorry. But I yeah. feel that way about anything, just about any art that I see in any, just about any institutional context, whether it's a gallery, whether it's a museum, whether it's in this room, anywhere. I mean, I, I can't separate the market and the, the kind of pollution of the market and, and, the, uh, and the <coughs> rhetoric of the market and the art speak of the market from the work itself. I just can't. And, that's just me, you know, I'm curious if anybody else feels that way because I, I feel like it's just totally contaminated at this point. It's totally contaminated. There's, there's, there's no way to separate it out. Gramsci, you know, Hirshhorn, okay, that, I mean, I go, I go there already, tried to hate it, and, well, yes, I did hate it. <laughs> and I know that a lot of people had, had the opposite reaction. I know that. And I've had this, I have had this discussion with any number of people that, oh, I, I went to hating it, but I but I actually I thought it was great. Okay. I, I can't do it. And you know, uh, maybe it's it's you know, maybe it's senility, I don't know. But um, I I I just I'm I'm completely uh, I feel like there's there's no separation now for me between the way the the art uh, the, the hierarchy of the art world and the the uh, gatekeepers at all levels uh, and you know and, and you were talking before about bad uh, bad social practice bad social practice is bad curating you know and you know and, and artists who not just and it's not just the artist's fault. The artists want to be in this context. They want the cultural capital. So they come up with something, goddammit, because they want to be in the show, right? You know? And uh, because otherwise they won't get in any other show. Yeah. Let's just, make sure, I, hold on, let's make no, sure I'm, we get I'm, one more question I, in. Just one, for, for well, something that, if, the one thing I, I do want to say that, that, that if we're talking about huh. relatively speaking progressiveness in this city, the fact that Tom Finkelkroll was appointed you know, yeah. The Commission of Cultural Affairs is a significant step yeah. in some in some progressive, more forward-thinking direction. And Tom has spoken quite often against, I think, this a certain ethos within the more market-based yeah. driven art world okay. for many years. That's yeah, why let's, I'm let's just make sure we get one more one more question. Three last question. question. Let's get one more.
urbanism over the past, you know, since at least Giuliani and longer, frankly. But um, I mean, they're different. Kind, they're, one can think of one can turn the word market against other. Or, I mean, I remember an exhibition quite a few years ago called Markets of Resistance. I mean, just for example. Now, maybe that doesn't go very far today, but. I mean, if one wants to repurpose that, that term, one, one can at least make an effort to do so. But I also think there are quite a few artists that, that, that are trying to operate in, on different platforms, gallery, museum, <coughs> so-called other liminal spaces that are not quite defined yet, even though many people want to define them as they produce discourse about them. So I, I don't think it's quite as binary as you're suggesting. and, and um, well, I, I use Andrea, uh, uh, but I also went to the border of Tijuana and San Diego, which is certainly not New York City, and that's not, there's no market, there's a gray market there, but there's no art market per se. I mean, I think actually um, that you, uh, you that, that it's very hard to work in, within the art world. and. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I've, you know, I've chosen not to, although it's also been very limiting. Um, like, the idea of having a show just seems ridiculous to me. Um, so, you know, I, I just don't, I, I'm hoping to find some other, uh, and, and constantly looking for, for alternative ways of, of putting my, you know, whatever my particular expertise of, of my life might be out there. But I mean, I, I, sitting here looking at this work, I, I also want to say, okay, um, uh, this is, uh, I mean, I don't consider this political, maybe it is politically motivated, who am I to say? But to me, all of this work is, is sort of speaking to, the, to art history and the canon and, and the market that exists out there. Uh, I, it's hard to see it, any of it as being politically motivated. So, you know, I mean, I, I guess I would, I would challenge that. Um, I would, personally, I would like to see, you know, if it would be possible to bring these artists together and talk about, you know, what is your life like in Cuba? And, you know, is this really what you want to do? You know, what, what would you really like to do? In Cuba, how would you see changing things in a particular? You know, I, that's what I, that would be the conversation that I would want to have with all of these artists, and it probably it's very, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's I should be I should have more humility, uh, but that that's that's that the position that I would take about what I'm looking at here. Can I just have, I, I know we have to wrap up, so to speak, but you said that you think doing a show is. An exhibition, I guess, in a gallery you're referring to, or yeah. a museum, or I don't know what. Yeah, yeah, both. Is, is, is ridiculous or ludicrous or not so for, for you? Okay. Why is that? I mean, because aren't you cutting your potentially, I mean, whatever doing an exhibition means today, which mm -hmm. I mean, are, are you concerned though that you might reach different, huh. different, different individuals, different constituencies, different audiences, different publics, counter publics, whatever terminology? I mean, there, there's that too. I mean, yeah. there are publics that enter into museums, and they are not simply an undifferentiated mob. I mean, they're, no, I so I, I, I just I wonder about the position. I, I, I respect what you're saying. I'm just asking why you arrive at this particular place. It just has it has to do with the fact that that my work is that the social component of my work is. And so it's something that's really hard. You can't really show. You can't be I just need to, articulate. As the moderator, I need to uh, mark. That's the last word. What do you have to say and from your vantage point in Montreal about about the art world in New York City? I don't know. I haven't been here long enough. But I would. Uh, you know, my last word is alienation. <laughs> <laughs> Separation. That is beautiful. <laughs> Everybody, uh, the, the conversation is free to continue. We have wine and cheese, right? Uh, let's keep arguing uh, as much as we want.
Thank you, wonderful, wonderful panelists, Barb Murray and Joshua. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donald and Shelley, for letting us